Hi, I'm Meg Studer, and today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about using the D3 library, um, specifically in combination with React, since we just learned that toolkit in React Redux. So let's see, how do I tap forward? Awesome. So what we're going to start with is just like a little introduction to the library, what it does when it was developed, um, and typical use cases. I'm sure you've all seen it before since kind of big data visualization has been like really trendy the last couple of years. After that, we're going to actually start from there at the very front end. So we'll start at the browser and look like what does a direct data display mean in the words of D3? What form does it take in terms of SVG graphics? And also then like what does it mean to put together a couple of lines of code to create a visualization? So just the raw JavaScript library without React. And then we'll move into thinking about like what the parallels are between React, Redux, and of course D3, because D3 claims the visualization comes like straight out of the data. It's all very data driven. Um, and obviously if you're working in Redux and React, you're thinking like everything comes from the store, it keeps track of everything. So how can we marry these two models together? Um, after that, I'll just show you one you know, quick, easy integration strategy so that if you're trying to do this at home or you want to hack some things together um, in a couple of weeks, like you have a good place to get started and it will feel comfortable and you'll know kind of where to go um, to launch into the world of big data visualization. And that will sort of be it. We'll see how fast or how slow this all goes. Um, so I'm excited to take you guys along on this journey into big data. Okay, so D3 is data driven documents. It works predominantly with SVG, scalable vector graphics, and it's a library that is massive, it's huge. As you can see, there's just sort of an overwhelming amount of different mechanisms, which is like different types of math to convert your data into meaningful symbolic displays using CSS, SVG, and then you know it all shows in HTML and the DOM. Um, developed in 2011, it's on v4.6. Um, and so at this point, you know, it's very robust. It's got a great wiki on GitHub. Um, and it also has this amazing kind of series of guests that are hosted by Mike Bostock, who developed it. Um, and I'm just going to, let's see, can we zoom over? Right. And the great thing about these is that, like, it's an open source community. People are building them all the time. So you can see what type of relationship you're showing. Um, and it lets you zoom in and zoom out and, like, think about what the user experience of these graphics are going to be. Um, whoops. And if we scale up, you see the way they're put together is actually the really simple HTML and then the JS script in there. So that like, if you are just getting started, you can go look these things up on his page and begin to browse them and like cut and paste and work with the code itself. So it makes it really accessible. I'm going to flip back, right? Um, so what are we working with? Now, we just had a great introduction to dealing with graphics in the web thanks to Sarah's presentation. And you have two major options, right? Typically, when you're working with HTML, you either have Canvas, which works according to pixels, right? You're like coloring by number, basically, to create your graphics. Um, or you have scalable vector graphics. And I'm a vector person. Vector's my native language. Um, the way that vector is defined is that you define anchors, right? And you can define the force that's pulling off those anchors, which then gives you an algebraic or geometric definition of a line. Anyways, what it means is that instead of having to keep track of every little box, you're keeping track of four or five points and like the information with them, right? So it's really lightweight, makes it faster. And depending on the library you use, when you use SVG graphics, they're held in the DOM in a hierarchy, right? So you can like draw a rectangle, two rectangles down in an SVG. It's a child, which means you can give it a class, an ID, attribute. You can continue to select it, modify it, and play with it. So it's great for interactivity. And when you get to the base of it, like Sarah was showing us, like, you know, it's defining things with points and lines. So that's not like the kind of the core the core elements are like mind blowing in terms of geometry. It's more or less just that like if you can get a computer to kind of figure out complex shapes for you, you can make amazing looking things and you can layer them together. So where have you guys seen D3? You've seen it all over the place. It's everywhere. Um, I'm just going to flip to a New York Times example. This is from one of their kind of data journalism pieces a couple months ago on rates of incarceration and kind of fierce sentencing. Um, and so if we flip over to this, what you see is this is just a typical choropleth map. Um, the idea is that we've got kind of incarcerations normalized by the population, and it's just showing every single county in the U.S. that it has that data for, right? 
So at the end of the day, we're simply like drawing every county in the country. And this is what we've got, our normalized data. We've probably got a shape file or a geometric kind of GIS file that's converted into GeoJSON. So we've got a bunch of JSON either out of our database or out of some TSVs or some CSVs, whatever your table format is. Um, we got some GeoJSON, so a little bit more JSON objects. And then what D3 does is it provides kind of the mathematics to translate positions for those kind of those more complex um, geographic files, as well as having ways of like mathematically subdividing color scales so that we can render like those intensities of value out to the browser. So I would say that, you know, like the stuff that's really, I think of as like the core D3 that you need to use is like the magic math stuff that does complex geometric transformations or provides kind of crazy, crazy kind of, you know, calculus for you. Um, and the SVG is stuff that's actually all fairly kind of recognizable. Um, because what we're doing here to make a really complex graphic is we're just iterating through an array of objects and sending them to the DOM, which at this point should sound really, really suspicious and familiar to you, because you're like, have I not been rendering through, iterating through arrays of objects to render them to the DOM for weeks at this point, right? Um, familiar, a little bit of deja vu, right? So before we jump into the fact that you're like, wait, I think I already know where we're going, uh, foreshadowing, um, let's just pause for a little bit, and I wanna just show you how simple the building blocks of the, that, that magic math are. Um, on the back end in a simple JS. So this is a chloroplast, it's a slightly different one, so they're not hacking the New York Times. Um, I'll let them keep their source code, uh, right? So this, I, what I've left out of this is at the top, there's a little bit of CSS that defines those like eight shades of blue, right? Class definitions. Really, really simple. We, at the top, we define an SVG size, and then about halfway down in the SVG DOM plus, which is a little bit of a weird way of saying it, we're basically using D3 selection methods that are very much like jQuery selections. So we go to the body, and we basically append an SVG at the end of it according to the size that we want. That's all very familiar and simple. Um, what we see at the top are the kind of, I'll call them the magic math, the D3 methods where you're actually chaining together a bunch of modifications. So you give it a data object and something like projection is gonna tell it like, we need to be working according to this projection type. Um, we need to rescale it to the scale. We need to translate it, which is to like shift it up or over based on where we wanna focus our map, right? Um, and so the projection works for mapping the quantiles, basically translating into those color blocks um, for the symbols. And then path is saying like, we know the projection, so now we're gonna take each one of those counties and map it into the right space for that browser we've defined. At the bottom, at the top, at the bottom of the top, um, the queue is basically uh, D3's version of working with asynchronicity. Um, so Rob was great, he just gave us a whole bunch of ideas about await. Um, so here, instead of pulling from a store at this point, they are just reading some local files in. So the GeoJSON right there, and then reading in just like different unemployment rates. Um, so you can visualize those intensities. And once that await ready has actually come back to us, we've handled the error. Down here, the core of what D3 is actually doing is contained in this first SVG chunk. Um, which all it's saying is like you have this SVG, within that, place a group, and what you're gonna do is give it the class of counties so that we know what it is. It's selecting all paths, which originally will be empty, but then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the data, enter, and append is like the core functionality of D3. It says take this huge data set, and we're going to map down to an individual feature. When we get to that individual feature, enter it, append a path to it, right? So this is really just the map function in different words. Um, and when we append to that path, the class that we define is of course based on those colors because we're pulling in our magic math quantile right there. And then the path D is literally like SVG D is always a path, so that's the complex geometry. That's the heart of it and it probably, I was gonna say Sarah just took like a page, like 80 lines to write a triangle and this is taking 80 lines because it's mapping, obviously it's working with that array, um, in order to kind of do a map of the US and color it. Um, so there's that efficiency, which is not just D3, but um, so that's what it looks like, you know, when we're just looking at it without thinking about why we might want to use it with React. 
Now, D3, in addition to the data enter append, also has a set of functions where you can add, like if you have a data set that's active, you can add a new data set and it's gonna automatically compare them. It thinks of them as two versions of the same kind of data set. So it says, oh, we, you know, five people died or eight people were born. Let me either kind of scrape out the ones that died. So it does a comparison at exit and removes them. Or I can enter and append and kind of readjust all those values. So it has its own, sorry, and I'm also running over time. So it has its own method for, um, being able to kind of update and incorporate new data. Um, but ultimately, we could be carrying that data set in the state, map it to our props, and actually pass it down just to normal SVG and do the same type of thing. Um, you know, and then dispatch up whatever we want to kind of uh, bubble up in terms of interactions. So obviously, the question is like, if D3 already handles this, why would we integrate these? So very rarely do you have a standalone visualization that you're doing outside of another web environment, right? So if you're already using a web environment like React and Redux to like keep things ordered, you don't want to actually duplicate that updating functionality. So why not just use your store, serve a portion of it, um, and save that for your data rate. Not only does it mean you're gonna get consistently formatted data, um, it means that you can also visualize all the other weird things that your users are doing actively and live in the store if you want to. This is, you know, this is like self-tracking. Um, just screams out, right? Um, already you've got React and Redux like watching the virtual DOM for you so they know when to update. You don't even have to think about it. Um, and obviously you can make your D3 as dumb as possible. Like just let the magic math do all the work and not think about any of these things. Um, now D3 does have native transitions and um, animation features, but at the end of the day, like in 2017, why not just do that in CSS? Grow up, learn to use the libraries everyone else uses, right? Sorry, not to pick on people who love that part of D3. Right, so, you know, this is a kind of a version of a diagram we've all seen before, right, where we're inheriting all the major data, and then we're just using local state for things like interactions, right? So this is based on some of the things that I was doing in review week, but ultimately, like, if you've got some geographic data in your master store, you can just pass it down, add interactions as you need them and bind them, and then give it to a visualization component that actually has the magic math of D3 to put it in the right projection, to begin to kind of add things together. And the reason why this becomes so awesome is because you can have a very standard set of data that you've inherited, but you can use three or four different diagrams with it. So you can tell a much more complex story that shows different facets of that information and allows you to tinker with it. Um, and so this will be a little bit redundant, and I'm running over time, sorry. Um, but this is essentially the same setup, which is a little bit hard to see, right? We are just connecting to map to the container, from the container to our props. I'm inheriting it here, we're going down, but the D3 geo state is essentially the active D3 section. Wow, that is really small, sorry guys. Um, again, and then the real magic, or the magic math, as I like to call it, right, is just really happening the moment we get in here. We've inherited all of this information that we can play with. Um, I'm setting up some variables for the outside SVG, just like to be parallel to the straight D3. Um, uh, there's some things that I'm tinkering with, but ultimately, like, the magic math all is between lines 44 and 54, right? We do our projection chaining to get things at the right position and scale. We use that projection to modify our path generator so we can do complex shapes. Um, and then I'm just setting up a couple of little variables to kind of push things up or down in that SVG frame. Ultimately down here, and I'm just gonna talk about this first chunk, right? We just have the SVG that's holding everything else, a path, and that D is using our path generator. So it's using all that complex geometry to actually translate out of our database and into the right format. And then ultimately we're mapping right here through our places so that we can take the XY coordinates from the database, reproject them onto the map and use them actively. Um, and so if I skip back, um, oh, let's zoom in a little bit, maybe. There we go. Not react, not responsive. All right, so this, um, which is a different problem with D3, but we won't talk about it now. Um, right, so this is essentially the result of that, right? Obviously, I'm not gonna draw that guy by hand or figure out how to do him, um, but that's the magic math working, and then all of the points that are on the map are the things that are stored in the database and we're seeing automatically translated. 
And of course, the value of having a couple of different, whoops, a couple of different things on the same interaction is that you know you all inherit the same kind of uh, mouse over and mouse out. So you can have them link up and respond to the same type of triggers all across that space, even if you've got two or three different um, different math sets uh, working together, right? Um, and so you're taking advantage of the store to keep everything coordinated, but you're also taking advantage of the advanced drawing methods in SVG that D3 makes available. And I think, so the other thing to say before I like radically exceed my time limit um, is that sometimes it can be really daunting to get started with D3 because the way that all the documents are written are for the very much vanilla version of SVG creation. It's the kind of the dot notation and the chaining of those modifications, right? So if you haven't touched it before, you end up looking at something like this on the left hand side um, and you're like, okay, how much SVG do I need to know to retranslate it? Now, some people have done it so that they actually build out the full inter, exit, et cetera, the full cycle in and evoked it while they're also using store. I think that's a little bit messy because you never know exactly when you're getting something updated and you also don't want to like accidentally append a thousand versions of the same thing as you load in other data. I would actually recommend like a really simple version where you, you just sit down with Mozilla developers kind of guidelines and you write out the SVG you want. That way you know like what's just straight SVG, which variables are really being modified by the D D3 kind of projections and the mathematical magic, and there's thousands of them. Um, you know, and you have a really good sense of control, so you can start very simple and build up to actual complexity. And that's, that's really it. I guess, you know, I kind of, I love SVG, um, and I love vector graphics, and so if anybody's got any questions, I would definitely encourage you to kind of come seek me out, and I'll help you hack through some things, because it's very exciting. Um, I also think, you know, like, this is, this is that moment where you can also scarily visualize all of your user data with your app, which is great too. Um, but thanks for listening, uh, humoring me. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you guys all like hacking into this very soon.